Hi everyone, my name is Kyle and I am here to teach this course today on intro to birding. Really excited. Birding is one of my favorite things to do when I'm outside uh, and I love sharing this activity with other people, helping build skills uh, that you'll be able to take and hopefully grow this passion of yours in this activity. And uh, I'm really excited to, to help guide you in that a little bit with this introductory course today. And I am currently the uh, manager of exhibitions and events at Tower Hill Botanic Garden. And so what that means is I just create a lot of educational experiences so that when people come to the garden, uh, they get to learn something uh, and they get to have a, a unique experience when um, they're on site. And in the past, I've been doing environmental ed for about 12 years, national park, wildlife sanctuaries, camps, nature centers, all over teaching a wide variety of things, having a wide variety of uh, positions, whether as a naturalist, a teacher, uh, or a, a program director. Uh, I've kind of done a lot of different different activities in a lot of different places. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm excited to share some of my knowledge with you today. Really what's gonna happen over the next hour is we're gonna dive a little bit into the benefits of birding, talk about some of the resources that are available to you or that you're gonna need to get more into birding. Uh, we'll start to talk about how do I ID a bird? What am I looking for? Uh, we'll start to build some of those skills. Uh, and then once we've done that, We'll get to practice a little bit using some photos of birds uh, and some of these new skills that you've developed. Then we'll get outside. I'll, I'll get outside, try and find some birds, see what we can do, and uh, then we'll we'll wrap up the the course before we know it. So really excited, and let's just get straight into it. I think it's a really important place to begin uh, is is talking about the benefits of birding, both personally and as a nature organization why would birding or keeping track of birds be uh, a beneficial thing to do so um, and those benefits are really going to be the driving force of, of why we're taking this course and why we continue to bird i think it's really beneficial to to start there when it comes to personally uh, there's some key elements of birding that I think are really important, um, really beneficial for us personally. And the first is that it really adds a fun element to your time out in nature. I think a lot of us probably in this group already go on walks, spend a lot of our time out, uh, whether in our neighborhood or on trails, local trails. And adding birding adds this other element that allows you to see your surroundings in a different way and, and look at them a little bit closer and in, in, in a unique way. So I like to say it's like a giant game of hide and seek. Every time that you go out in nature is an opportunity to find something that you've never seen before um, and maybe on top of that something you only see once in your life. So it adds this, this fun element to, to time outdoors. The second is that it's just a really easy animal to find. It's very abundant and since you have that element of it, it's one of those great introductory places into conservation or environmentalism. Uh, and, and plus you feel good when you're out hiking and you do, uh, when you're looking for something, you find it. So it, it's really, it's rewarding, um, but also a great introductory place to, um, to get into conservation. And on top of that, there's just a lot of available resources and I think the, the resources have really grown because there's just a great community of people that love to bird, love to go out and uh, show what they found. And so these resources have really grown. Plus, there's a lot of uh, environmental organizations completely devoted to uh, the, the protection of birds and the study of birds. So the resources and the community have both grown really well together. Uh, and then provide more resources for you in terms of um, you know getting to grow in terms of your knowledge of birds and maybe get into more conservation or environmentalism. It's just a great place to begin. And then lastly, it's, it's really just enjoyable. I love every time I, I go out and locate different birds and get the opportunity to, to see something completely new. Um, they're just really fascinating species. So there's a lot of personal personal benefits to getting out. And when it comes to uh, an organization, why might an organization want to, to pay attention to birds or spend any time on birds? The first is that a, an organization uh, like a garden, a public garden, uh, or a, a nature center 
um, a protected land can really provide habitat that is otherwise really being impacted. A great example is uh, grassland habitat. We have a lot of grassland. Um, our grasses now, especially in the east, that are just mowed, they're constantly mowed, so there's no time to really benefit from that uh, habitat. But a lot of organizations can create habitat like grassland that can maintain over a long period of time and the birds can, can benefit more from uh, that habitat, uh, an, an animal species like a meadowlark. Uh, so these nature organizations have that ability to really impact positively a, uh, a species that is in a lot of ways negatively impacted. And on top of that, the same, one of the same things for us personally it, the bird species, since it's so abundant and easy to find, it can provide us a lot of opportunity to use it for those conservation uh, things I mentioned before. For example, it's just it can be a great indicator of environmental health. One of the key traits um, or key terms that is thrown around a lot is biodiversity. So. You know, how many different bird species are in one location. If we have that or monitor that, then a bird can, um, bird species can, can tell us a lot. Or if, for example, we have a pretty common bird that we haven't seen for years and years, uh, that may tell us something uh, uh, as well. And it is an easy place to do that because just like personally, we like resources. Professionally, we like resources too. Uh, they can really help us in doing the top two things, providing, um, you know, positively impacting our environment and two, using this species to, to tell us, continue to tell us things about uh, our environment. Now that we've talked more about the benefits of birding both personally and um, as an organization, now it's really important to get into the tools and resources that are available to you um, for birding or things that you're going to need. And uh, we're going to talk about them in a couple ways, both the, the physical tool and resource and then what might be available for you online or on your phone. And the first tool that you can only really use in person is your binoculars. So this is my pair of binoculars and uh, it's, it's about a medium size. Uh, it's really um, a good size for me um, and has really served me well as a pair of binoculars. And one of the biggest questions I get is what what binoculars should I get? What should I use? And really the most important thing to me and what I would pass along is that uh, the optics are really the most important thing. You don't need the biggest, the most expensive uh, but not pair of binoculars to have good optics and those optics is really just how clear your picture is your vision when you do locate a bird if it tends to look a little bit like you've got water in your eye um, things are really crisp clear that's where you start to get into a lot of issues about uh, of being able to identify a bird. So we're not going to get into every single pair of binoculars. Uh, there is a really helpful guide that was put together by the Audubon that lays out some good resources for choosing binoculars uh, at different levels. So uh, when we talk about the online resources, I'll pull that little guide up that you can use to help guide you in, in picking a pair of binoculars. The one thing I will say is it's not always about the binoculars and what they are able to do. Uh, a big part is what you want out of your pair of binoculars. So for example, I tend to go with this medium sized pair because I do a lot of hiking, really long hikes. I don't want a huge pair of binoculars to get in my way all the time. So this one really does well for me. So I would think about what type of birding are you really going to do and try and match a pair of binoculars that that fits to that uh, instead of thinking well this pair of binoculars can see really far or this pair of binoculars can do x y and z um, just think is my picture clear are the optics good does it have a, a nice clear picture and uh, is it doing what i want uh, out of a pair of binoculars does it match uh, my lifestyle and, and, and the way that i'm going to burn so binoculars the next resource that uh, you are going to need, and this is the one that can be available in person or it can be available online, and that is an ID guide. And I definitely recommend that if you do have your own personal uh, ID guide that you take it out for this course, you're gonna need it. And it's good to keep practicing with that. Uh, the other recommendation I have is that there's so many different kinds of uh, ID guides, I think it's really important that you find the one, just like the binoculars, an ID guide that matches you and, and your style of birding, the things that you're going to need. So 
And that's why I definitely recommend actually picking up the physical guide, opening it, reading through it, and seeing if it matches the way that your brain operates. Some have a lot of content, some have minimal content, some organize that content in one way, and another one organizes it in a different way. And so it's really just helpful to, to uh, dig deep into that ID guide. And my, my few recommendations of things that you're definitely going to want in your ID guide the more you get into birding uh, is really three big things. Uh, the first, and this is what most ID guides do have, that is some sort of a photo, something to, to have reference to, uh, an actual visual. And uh, some go into to more detail into those visuals. Uh, as you can see, mine tends to point out some key traits. Um, but having either a drawing or a photo is going to be really, really helpful. The next is that the, the, the space that's next to this is, I think it's good to have a, a bit of information. There are ID guides that have absolutely zero. There are ID guides that have a boatload of information. If you have at least just a small paragraph, one, to learn something, and two, it's really going to help you in some of the more minor details that are really hard to pick up on your photo. So maybe it's call or some small little coloration on the bird. So I do think it's helpful to have a description, a short description at least. And then the last I don't think is essential, but I do think it's really helpful. As you can see on my ID guide, it's uh, the I the guide of the eastern birds east of the Rockies. That's a that's a pretty big area. So I think it's really helpful, and you're going to learn more about this as we get in. I think it's really helpful to have a range uh, maps, an assortment of range maps that can tell you where this bird actually resides. It nests, it breeds, it changes uh, all the time. So that can really help you. Uh, in IDing a bird, which we're going to get into in a little bit. Um, so that's the physical, two, two physical things that you can have in your hand, but then there is also the online resources. There are quite a bit of online resources that are available for you if uh, you, know, you don't find an ID guide that you like or you just like to have a, a, a virtual uh, tool to use. And there is really a, a large database of information out there. So uh, if you would rather use the online resource or you don't have an ID guide yet, there's really a lot. And uh, I wanted to start with pulling up the binocular resource that I talked about earlier. And the, uh, as you can see on the Audubon website, so again, the Audubon is an organization really devoted to bird conservation and management. Uh, the Audubon has a, a really helpful binocular guide that can help you identify you know, what type of binoculars that you can use and, and what you might need and they separate into some really helpful categories so there's a top of the line really the, the high end and you can see that most of them are really separated by um, the, the price so if you keep going down you know high end again just continuing to go down in cost uh, and then way at the end is a get in the game sum of the um, you know, lower cost binoculars that really have still good optics, uh, really give you a clear picture. So uh, this is a really helpful tool if you want to use that. Now, when it comes to identification, there is some helpful online tools, which online may help you when you're back at home. Uh, it's, it's probably going to be not as helpful when you are out hiking. Uh, but we will talk about apps that you have available as well. Now, the uh, Audubon, again, this is the Audubon website, has a tab devoted to identifying birds. You can see at the top, um, there's just a little thing for bird guide. And as you scroll down, uh, there's a way to break it up by region. So if you click region, and for me, um, the region would be in New England, and it will load and it will only bring up birds that you're going to find in New England which is really helpful that you know creating your your region and the, really the way that you would do and use this is you have the the photos and you could go through until you find um, a photo you know if you think you know the family uh, then you can definitely uh, put in the family and it will narrow it down it might be a little bit harder uh, if you don't know those you know we're just introductory so you you may not know the family which is okay you're just going to have to spend time scrolling and trying to locate a bird that looks similar and then you know if you find that bird say you found a goldfinch you can click goldfinch 
and it will bring up and provide all that extra information that you can try and, and learn a little bit more and maybe verify if it was the bird that you found. So you've got the Audubon. Another one is the Cornell Lab, which is a, another pretty commonly used uh, group that has a lot of great information, uh, a place that I go if I really want to dive into some of the um, deeper information when it comes to uh, a bird. I tend to not use it for identification, more just for learning and you know, expanding my knowledge of different species, but they also have a, uh, a page, as you can see at the top, it just says guide, um, another page for different species. Now theirs is going to be act a little differently. They don't list out every species in a way like the Audubon did and I think probably your best way to do it is to go on this um, browse guide and go to shape and when you pull up the shape you're really going to narrow down to um, different some different species and you're going to learn that this is one of the things one of the first things you're going to do when you uh, ID a bird and you'll be able to narrow it down so um, you saw a bird that kind of looks like this one and you can click it, it might be a chickadee and uh, it'll bring everything up and there's where you're going to narrow down your list of things that you can uh, ID your bird. So you've got a couple good online resources here. And when you aren't at your computer and you're out hiking, you need an app. There's a couple really good apps. Probably the best app, going back to the Audubon, uh, is another really good app that you can download on your phone. And when it comes to that app, they tend to ask you really good questions, like what was the shape, colors, and, and they really help navigate the IDing process for you, which is helpful. A lot of people tend to, to like that, that they don't need to scroll through and do the IDing themselves, um, that they have an app that's, that's helpful. So the Audubon app is really uh, a nice tool. So you can go on to your app store, download it for your phone. And the nice part about that, sometimes, uh, you know, I have an app on my phone as well in case I forgot my ID guide or I'm on a long hike and I don't want to take my, my this big book with me. It, sometimes it's helpful that you can only have a, a you know your phone and a smaller resource that still has all the capacity to, to show you everything that you want. So that's probably the, the best app to go on and use. And then another really good resource is something called eBird, which is something I use as well. And eBird is a little bit differently. It's not really an ID guide, and it's more just a, a way to connect the community and participate in conservation. So you can come on the website and it will, um, well, I should backtrack. eBird is a way that you can create checklists of birds that you find and log different birds. And all people um, around the, the globe use eBird and log their own. So you can come on to the website and you can find uh, more birds. And uh, what happens is it will bring up a nice map and everyone else's checklists will show up on that map. Uh, and you can click and see if anybody found anything um, close by. And then you know you get to share your own. When you have the app, it just creates a, a checklist, and you log the birds that you found, and it uploads to this database. And it's another great way to help with uh, again conservation, environmentalism. So it's another really uh, helpful app. Whenever I go out and uh, I bird, uh, I tend to log everything I find on eBird. One, it just helps me keep track of the things that I found that year, and two, it just puts another layer of, of uh, another element to the act of birding that I'm contributing to data in the uh, conservation of, um, just in the conservation realms, I'm just contributing to, to the data. So another really, really helpful tool. Uh, these are probably some of the best tools that you have out there that are that are online. So, you know, as we move forward, if you have an ID guide, use that. If you don't have an ID guide, you can download the Audubon app uh, or you can just use online uh, to try and help ID uh, for this workshop. So, and, and go really forward with, you know, whatever is your, um, you know, it's really a, a big preference for most people, I tend to tap into all of them in little ways, but uh, it's really up to you on what you really enjoy and what's helpful to you. So now that we've talked about tools, we are going to get into the nitty gritty stuff and that's all about how do I ID a bird? And it's one of the biggest reasons that people take uh, an introductory course. Uh, they uh, I often hear a lot that 
I see birds all the time. I don't know what it is. And I really want to uh, know what it is, which I love. People are curious about birds and trying to um, know what it is that they're seeing, which is really uh, all about the, the core of being a naturalist is you know, your curiosity and what you're surrounded by and uh, being able to read you know, nature. So we're going to get into how do I go through the process of IDing a bird and how do I get some of those um, you know, skills necessary for uh, getting the right identification and making sure it is the, the right bird that I think it is. So we're going to talk a little bit about anatomy, habitat, um, behavior, all these things are important into uh, being able to correctly identify. So I'm going to be pulling up a PowerPoint that has uh, certain graphics on it that are going to be helpful for us. I'm going to be talking during it, so make sure you're definitely keeping your volume up uh, as we go through it, but uh, it's just going to be the PowerPoint up on the screen. When it comes to identifying a bird, there is a lot of information that you are going to want to try to collect to really download. And one of the tips that I always give birders when we're out birding is when you first locate a bird, focus on it and try to intake as much as possible. Uh, the larger details down to the smallest and then go to your ID guide. And uh, it's pretty common that I do see people really put the bird into their binoculars, get a couple things, go to their ID guide, realize they didn't gather enough information, try to go find the bird again, and it's gone. And that makes uh, identification really tough when you feel like you need more information. So we're going to talk about what that information is, what you really need to try and download, and we're going to go through it in a, a few different ways. And I do think it's helpful to, to go through it the, the way that we're going to go through it and um, there's some things to do first and then just kind of work your way through piece by piece and each little piece can hopefully in the end help you get to the end conclusion of being able to identify the bird that you have in front of you. One of the best places to, to really begin in terms of identifying a bird is the size and shape of the bird. And uh, you know when it comes to size, size is really helpful because that can help us narrow down what it is that we have in front of us. So if I were to say something like, you know, our bird is about the size of a cell phone, then that could probably rule out we have a red-tailed hawk in front of us, which is much larger than a cell phone. And so it can really narrow down um, and rule out a bunch of birds that you have in front of you. And then when it comes to shape, shape is really important because shape has become one of the more consistent traits across a species. Uh, we've had a lot of changes within species due to things like climate change and it's affecting things like coloration, uh, it's affecting things like range, you know, where that bird typically is. Uh, so uh, some traits have been pretty variable, and, but shape, shape has, has proven to be pretty consistent. Uh, throughout the years and throughout our species, so so shape is really helpful, and we can look at shape in a number of different ways, uh, as we'll see all across uh, the bird we have in front of us here, which is an American robin. So we have the robin, which we can go all the way to the the. If we think about the whole bird itself, this is a pretty more long and slender type of bird. Uh, it's a little bit rounded and, and plump here in the front, uh, but tends to, to really be long all the way through instead of short and kind of um, circular and plump. So we, we have a, a more long bird. And then if we uh, start all the way at the, the top, we have our beak and beaks come in all different shapes and sizes, depending upon what that bird does, what it eats. So probably one that we're really familiar with is something like a woodpecker that has a super long beak to uh, drill holes into logs and be able to uh, get the food inside. And our robin here has a kind of in-between beak. It's it's not exactly short and, and stout. It's not very long. It's kind of in between uh, a nice beak to still be able to, to dig into things and, and gather food, whether that's uh, into the ground or into a pine cone. Uh, so a nice kind of in-between beak, uh, a little bit long and slender, but um, definitely some size to it. And then if we go up towards the head, uh, you know, the robin, since um, the robin has, has this, this more rounded head shape, which can be helpful if you know a blue jay, a blue jay has a more 
uh, tufted head, you know, the feathers come up to a point, so the, the shape of the head can play into it. And as we go down the wings, so uh, one of the, the two more focused on things with, with wings is the, the span, so from one side to the other side when they're open, uh, how long that is, and then uh, wings can can come uh, in a variety of shapes depending upon the feathers and, and how long the feathers grow, some of the primary, secondary, the, uh, the different feathers, which those things are, are tend to be more apparent when the bird's in flight, uh, being able to use the, the wing length and, and shape. Uh, we can go down to the tail. The tail uh, also comes in a variety of different uh, shapes and sizes, so uh, how long or short, and some are rounded on the bottom and some are forked. Uh, probably one of the more common forked birds would be the uh, barn swallow, and the barn swallow has a very deep fork to its tail, which is a really defining, unique trait of that bird. And uh, so we can find a lot of different things in the tail shape. Uh, the, the legs, the legs provide a lot of insight as well. Some birds have very long legs, uh, like a blue heron, because a blue heron stands in water uh, a lot of the time. So the long legs uh, can, can help it uh, gather food uh, as it's standing in uh, different varieties of, of, of wetlands. And so the, the length of the legs uh, definitely comes into play. And the shape, maybe webbed toes, uh, talons, uh, those things can tell us a lot. So the shape definitely has uh, a lot of uh, helpful tips um, that can can really narrow down and, and let us focus on, on what species uh, we have. Color is the next really big area where uh, it, it, there's helpful content with uh, IDing a bird. It's definitely one of the, the first places that people want to go. They tend to go to color before they do with size and, and shape. I would definitely recommend, uh, again, doing size and shape first to narrow it down. And then color is going to help you narrow it down even further. And often there are blanket statements people make for color, but we're, we need to break color down into the, the more uh, localized areas that you can see a lot of these arrows are pointing to. This uh, isn't everywhere that you will find color, um, different colors, but definitely some of the, the key areas where you can find some of those different colors. Uh, and again, we have the, the robin here, and one of the, the colors that's really going to stick out about the robin is this whole underside of the bird, this um, you know, rusty orange, red, brown color underneath. And if we were out birding and uh, somebody was, would say, oh, well, this, this bird has um, some, some orange to it, the first question I would ask is, is where? And, um, you know, if we were, we were out there, you could say on its chest, this um, kind of on its chest area or, or the belly area. So uh, we might say it's, it's on its chest and belly, this whole area. Some birds will have just this coloration on the chest and then it's, its belly might be a different color. But for our robin here, it's, it's the whole thing. And then can go down even further and then even this rump area on, on top underneath can, it can be a separate color, which for the robin it is this, this white color. Our, our uh, orangish, reddish color changes into the, the white. And then you can go up in, into the, the throat area and we, we do get a pretty stark uh, line here that separates these two areas of color. And uh, it's, it's dark. It's actually the whole head kind of is this uh, dark blacker color but really one of the another key trait of the robin is this this white circle around its eye you'll probably in your ID guide see that it's one of the features that is um, called out in the uh, the bird so we've got our um, this this white eye here so and then on the beak this beak here is yellow uh, definitely there are different colors of, of beaks not all are, are yellow so this might also be another thing your ID guy might point out for the robin uh, this this yellow beak um, some are black dark um, and, and some are this yellow color so definitely beak color something people might not think about too much 
Uh, then we've got uh, the back area of the neck here and then down to the wings. And there is a, a lot of different areas on the wings uh, that you can look for. Uh, there is the primary feather, some secondary feathers. You'll just kind of see the, this break um, of different groupings of feathers. And uh, the whole thing could be one color or as you can see even here on, on the robin, we've got some, some streaks of white. Uh, or there might be some bars of color, some white bars that some of our other birds that we'll see today uh, do have some some unique uh, coloration on their wing. And then even uh, you know taking it all the way down to to the tail, the the tail has some different coloration as well. There might be uh, say a continuation of this rust color may go all the way down to the underside of the tail. It doesn't for our uh, robin here, but that is a possibility in some birds that we'll we'll see that. Uh, coloration underneath the tail. Uh, there might be coloration on top of the tail and then all the way on the bottom sometimes there is uh, just like we might have wing bars on the bottom of the tail there is a, a band of, of color as well sometimes maybe like a white band uh, of, of coloration down there. So uh, there's a whole spectrum of, of places that we can find color and really utilize that to to help us. And you know just a disclaimer that the the coloration that you find in your ID guides or in a, in a drawing or a photo sometimes it's just like a perfect color. Uh, it, these things can often change and, and have some um, you know unique traits from bird to bird even though it is the same species so there is a lot of, of benefit to using color sometimes it's limited and, and can take you in, in wrong directions uh, but um, that's why it's good to start with the size and shape and then come to color and, and hopefully use this to uh, help you uh, narrow down what it is that you have in front of you Another big trait that people use to identify a bird is the song or the call it makes. There's a, definitely a wide variety of different calls that are very helpful, especially if you're looking for birds, say at night, like an owl, an owl call can be really helpful. Or different songbirds, you probably have a lot of calls of birds around your own home. Uh, for example, a pretty common one uh, is say a cardinal. And I think what's really helpful is that you take these song calls and either one, try to uh, associate it with something for example the cardinal I tend to think sounds a lot like a laser you know it goes it just sounds like a, a laser shooting out to me uh, or you can uh, see the bird itself making the call I think that that's a very helpful tip that I received when I first started getting into birding was to actually witness the bird doing it this tends to be a little bit more of an advanced uh, trait that people use to identify a bird oftentimes because uh, we can't see it. There's so many different variables in song calls, um, so many different unique things. So you'll pick up more and more on the calls as you go along and uh, start to see more birds and get more into birding and it can become a really helpful tool. You've got a lot of traits now and it, it's really helpful to start thinking about some other things related to the bird that might provide some clues in terms of identification and uh, one of those would be habitat and habitat might be something that's already on the front of your mind uh, it might just be coming without even really thinking about it uh, you know oh I'm looking at water you might not have to, to tell your brain you're doing that uh, but you know once you've pulled out all these different traits stopping for a moment and recognizing where am I finding this bird can really help you in possibly deducing uh, more clues about what you have in front of you. Like our mallard here is in water and um, you know it might be helpful when you're looking at water to recognize is it fresh water, is it salt water. Uh, both of those things can really help you determine what you would be more likely to find. So habitat uh, really letting that be one of the 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 foreground things that you're thinking about uh, once you've gone through uh, most of your physical or audio traits. Another really helpful tool in determining what bird you have is uh, its behavior and the things that it's doing uh, while you're you're viewing it can really uh, provide some nice clues into figuring out what the bird is, especially when traits like physical traits are really hard to see. 
Uh, take example, this uh, bird in the slide, this turkey vulture, if it's up in the sky, it might be really, really hard. We, we, we see now we have some of that shape of the wings, that's really evident uh, wingspan, uh, but some things like coloration are really, really hard to, to pull out on the bird. So its behavior can be really, really helpful. And you know, what behavior of a turkey vulture? You might have seen it in the sky in some of its circular patterns. Sometimes in movies, it's, it's circling in the sky. And that's actually because it relies on things called thermal updrifts, these circular, uh, uh, these circular pockets of air, that it catches a, a lot of that updrift that it can just fly in between them without having to, to flap its wings. It is a scavenger, so it doesn't really want to waste energy uh, that it doesn't uh, have a lot of. So that unique trait really, really sticks out for this bird in particular. Uh, maybe another behavior would be something like a woodpecker who's drilling a hole into a log. Uh, pretty unique trait of a woodpecker. So behavior can be really, really helpful. The next really helpful tool is, is range. And it's range is one of the, the later tools that you're gonna be able to use when trying to ID a bird. You don't necessarily need the bird in front of you to use this tool. Uh, definitely ranges um, tends to be one of those more checks and balances uh, in terms of your identification you might feel pretty confident in the bird that you have and then you can go to your range map and confirm that it is a bird that you would even see and maybe see at that time of year because the range maps comes in uh, a variety of colors that you know showcase uh, where a bird may be during a different time of year and doing what. So it tends to be things like nesting and breeding or migrating. So a range map can be really, really helpful, especially if you think you may have a rare bird, uh, a bird that um, you have never seen before. It's definitely one of the opportunities to, to go in and confirm that that is a species that you would have. A great example of how this could come into effect for me is uh, in New England, um, you know, we have uh, lots of chickadees and we tend to have black capped chickadees. There's a pretty similar, very similar species, the Carolina chickadee, uh, that looks pretty spot on, has some differences in, in uh, song um, and slight coloration color um, in size, but they, they look pretty identical. And uh, I can come to the conclusion that I, I probably would not be seeing a Carolina chickadee that's just a lot more rare uh, in my area. And if I did feel like I saw one, um, then I would definitely uh, be more vigilant about confirming the different traits of uh, that chickadee just to, to be sure. So range can definitely uh, play a part in helping uh, feel confident in what bird you have in front of you. One of the last things that you can really use to help determine if you have found the right bird is just remembering the, the time of year that you are seeing this bird. This might be something, again, that's on the forefront of your mind, something that you're thinking about. You know, if it's winter and you're going out hiking, you probably know it's winter. Uh, but it's, it's good to call back on that information when you think you have determined the bird that you have in front of you. Take, for example, winter, uh, a lot of birds migrate, so there's going to be a lot less birds that are around during that time of year. So if you are walking along and you think you've seen a red bird and you come to the conclusion you think it's a, a beautiful summer tanager, uh, the summer tanager would not be around during the winter time, so you can rule that bird out. Unlike our junco here in the photo, the dark-eyed junco, uh, as you can see, perched on a some sort of wood that is covered in snow would be around in the winter time and our junco um, we can feel confident that we have indeed found that bird uh, that would be around during this time of year so bring that up to uh, the forefront of your mind in determining if you have found the right species or helping you determine the right species uh, it can be a really really helpful tool uh, and kind of pairing this also with your range map uh, those two can kind of work uh, hand in hand with each other now that we've talked about different things that you're going to need or different uh, tools that are really helpful for you for IDing a bird, we're going to try and put this into practice. So uh, what we're going to do is I'm going to put up a photo of a bird and I want you to pause the video uh, at that bird and then go through the process. Uh, think about its shape, its size, its colors. Um, and then some of the other things are going to be a little bit trickier, like habitat and behavior. Um, but uh, think about 
you know, based on a lot of the, the beginning things of, of shape, size, color, pull out those traits and see if you can ID it uh, based on your uh, ID guide. And then uh, once you think you have it, write it down. And then I'm gonna uh, press play, you press play, and then we'll have a second picture come up of a very similar bird with a lot of similar traits and see if you can ID that bird as well. Um, so when the, the other picture comes up, pause it, try to ID it, and once you think you have it, uh, write down what you think it is. So uh, you should have two birds uh, possibly identified, and then we'll come back and I'll put both up on the screen and we'll talk about them, uh, we'll ID them, and talk about some of the differences and some of you know why is it what it is. Uh, so uh, we're gonna put the first photo up, Pause the video, uh, take a chance at uh, trying to ID it. Hopefully you've gotten to guess what the first bird is, so we're gonna put up a, a picture of the second bird, so pause it and try to identify it. Hopefully you've had a chance to try and ID the birds that we have in front of us, and uh, if you haven't, I definitely encourage you to definitely go back a little bit or, or pause here and, and try to uh, take a chance at IDing and pulling out some of these unique traits that we have uh, in both bird species. And before I tell you what the birds are, we're going to go through some of those traits that are really helpful in knowing some of the things that we've just previously learned uh, that are helpful to use in terms of IDing both from you know these species from other species uh, that aren't really closely affiliated to each other and then you know, these two species that we have here in front of ourselves. And you know when it comes to all the things that we know are useful, uh, the one that I really mentioned that we should begin with is really hard to tell in a photo and that's size. So to, to give you a little glimpse of the size, it's probably about the size of a, of a common cell phone now. It's not too large. Um, so that can really help us in determining what we have in front of us. Uh, for example, size of a, of a cell phone, we know it's not, say, a chickadee, which is definitely smaller, and it's not a, a red-tailed hawk uh, uh, as another great example. So we know we've got about the size, maybe something a little bit more narrowly. It's definitely smaller than our robin, so we know it's not something like a robin or a blue jay. So we've got the size when it comes to shape. Um, there aren't really any two defining feather traits, like a tuft, uh, so feathers probably aren't gonna provide us too much. We can go to the beak, and we did talk about a beak, and the beak here is definitely short and, and stout. Um, you know, really powerful beak for breaking things open, like, uh, like seeds, so we've got um, this short, really powerful beak on both, uh, so that's not really gonna help us. The coloration is a little different in, in both, um, but in terms of shape, uh, that shape is not going to provide us too much. And then uh, if we go down, you can't see it, the tail. The tail does have a slight fork in it. It's not a, a rounded tail, um, but the, the the tail does have a slight fork to it. Uh, the legs aren't long, so we can roll out uh, something like uh, a blue heron who has very long legs for standing in water. Uh, we know we don't have too long of, of legs, most likely not a water bird and um, not too sharp of talons, so talons are probably gonna rule out. We don't have webbing, we don't have, we don't have talons, so our legs aren't providing us too much. We can definitely rule things out, um, you know, different bird species out. And then, um, yeah, so we've got the shape, some different things from the shape. And then if we go to coloration, coloration probably provides us more with this species, especially to tell from the other species. Uh, so we've got the, obviously the red color. So, um, you know, if you know a lot of bird species, a bunch of different red species might come into mind, like a, a cardinal or a summer tanager, uh, all have red coloration. And the coloration of the red is in some unique spots on both birds, and that's really gonna help us determine from, from the species from one another. So we have this really dull, the one on the bird on the left, we have this dull red color on the, the crown, on the throat. Uh, this this dull color actually doesn't really um, come here on the side of the face below the eye. 
uh, isn't really that red color. So it's really focused on the crown, on the throat, into a little bit into the chest, a little bit on the back of the, the wings here, um, and also a little bit here on the top of the tail. You can see it's faint. Uh, and then one of really defining traits of this particular um, bird is that it goes from this red color and then transfers into this more black, dark brown streaks here along the, the underside of the bird. Um, nothing really on the, the wings. Uh, we have some, some white coloration and which um, doesn't stand out too, too much. Um, but this is really the, the color that, that stands out and tells us a lot, especially here on the, the, the chest and, and belly. And if we go over to the other one, it's the, the same red, but in a totally different way. It's very bright and vibrant. Uh, with this species, often talked about how it looks like it's dipped in Kool-Aid or raspberry juice. Uh, and, you know, if something's dipped in it, then that red is in way more places, which we can easily see. The whole head, uh, the, the, the chest, all the way down to the belly, uh, the top of the wings, into the wings themselves, and here along the top of the tail. So that red is all over the place um, and, and every uh, kind of nook and cranny. And there, there is some slight changes, like there's some obviously some white here, um, some darker color around the eye. Uh, but if we're narrowing down between these two species, uh, this chest area, um, to this chest area is going to really make them stick out and, and the, the vibrance of the red color between the two really sticks out. In terms of where you'd find this, I mean, you're probably going to find it in your backyard, uh, in some low shrubs, bushes, low trees, uh, anywhere it can find some of its more common food, maybe even on the grass, uh, could be on the ground, possibly trying to find some food. This is a bird that you would probably locate in a bird feeder. Uh, trying to get some food. Uh, so this is probably more your eye level uh, where this bird would, would come into to view in most spaces. And range, uh, it's again, it's, it's pretty common in most, most spaces. Um, uh, more, upper, more times than not, uh, those who are watching this video would probably have both species in your region. So that's, that's probably not gonna dictate uh, one over the other. Uh, range and then behavior their behavior is not going to vary too much from each other either uh, but they are doing some of the things that some other species would do uh, say like standing in water um, and again they're going to be perched on branches um, trying to find food in low shrub areas so um, really narrows us down to, to some songbirds uh, to um, to the species that we have here so if we're going to ID them uh, you know, that red color again sticks out, uh, where the red color is, the size of the bird, where we're gonna find it, and we know it's a songbird. Uh, so we can really narrow it down that we've got some finches in front of us. The left, the one on the left, this is a house finch, uh, and the one on the right is a purple finch, and that red color really dictates um, you know, where that red color is, where it's prominent, and these streaks here really differentiate between the, the two species that we have. We're going to do another one, try and uh, practice our identification skills. So we're going to do the same thing, put up a, a photo and try an idea, write it down. And then I won't uh, stop between these two photos to uh, warn you of the next one. So we'll put up a photo, pause it, um, pause the video, try and ID it, write it down, press play. The next photo will come up pause it, try an idea, write it down, uh, and then we'll come together and talk through, you know, what the birds are and some of their differences. So hopefully now you've had a chance to try and ID these two bird species that we have now here in front of us side by side. If you haven't, again, definitely encourage you to, to go on and, and try to um, ID the species before we dive too deep into it here. And so again, before I ID it, we're going to go through some of these traits and see if we can pull out some, some unique traits from both bird species that we have. Uh, so if we start with size again, one of those really hard things to notice here on our bird. Uh, they are a larger bird, probably pretty comparable to the robin that we had. Uh, definitely larger than a cell phone. Um, probably not as, as large as a, a tablet. Um, so kind of one of those in between. Uh, probably about the size of a robin, a blue jay, and getting about that size. 
and looking at other defining shape traits, uh, we have nothing that really stands out in terms of feather traits, um, no tuft, uh, nothing unique in, in, in terms of uh, feather shapes. Uh, it is a more long and slender bird, and we do have the beak. The beak is, is larger, kind of one of those, again, in between beaks. It's uh, not as small and compact and, and stout as the finch beaks, um, but not as long and, and pointy as a woodpecker beak. So we definitely have that, that in between. Again, looking at things like it's eating like seeds, uh, fruits, and um, insects too. So something to be able to, to slide in, break things apart, um, pull things off. Uh, so we have that kind of in-between beak. And then all the way down to the tail, we can actually see our, our tail here. You can um, notice on the bottom, uh, it, it kind of appears like it's uh, it's it's forked in our uh, bird, but it's it's not really actually that def defining of a fork. It's actually a little bit um, more rounded uh, than it is forked, uh, definitely than the, than the finch. Um, and that'll actually be on, on both uh, species of birds that we have here. Um, so not a really huge defining trait on um, the tail either. And then the legs, the legs uh, uh, kind of the same as the finch, not long and uh, more short more of a perching legs, not huge talons. Um, so we can roll out some species from all of those things and uh, narrow down to, again, more of our, our songbirds. And we do have some, uh, just like the, the finch, some pretty drastic coloration in both species that we have in front of us. And uh, that's gonna be one of the ways that we can really differentiate uh, between the two. And these are actually really, really nice photos. These are a, a great example of how photos can be uh, sometimes a little bit misleading because uh, we do have some great, great prime examples. The one we have on the left is that bright orange is really coming through very, very strong uh, on that bright orange. And sometimes you can find Orioles that are, are this vibrant. Uh, I would imagine that the editing brought out even more of this vibrant color. Um, but it is a bright, beautiful uh, orange color that we have here on our left species. And uh, probably where the, the, the photo doesn't do it quite justice, I think it's, its head is, is um, you know, how it's perched. This black tends to actually come down uh, a little bit more. So I think the way that it's sitting on this branch is reducing some of that black um, on its chest, which you can see here on this one, that black comes down a lot more. Uh, this black color uh, actually does a pretty similar thing on, on this species as well. Uh, but if we go to then to our one on the right, this orange color is a lot more rusty and, and uh, dark, a uh, darker orange color. Uh, so we we have mostly other than that, the the coloration, the, the, the depth of that color, the brightness of that color. A lot of the other traits are the same. Um, this black all along its head into the the chest, the throat and chest area, the, the wings and to have some of that white involved. Uh, and then on the underside, actually the, the, the coloration um, on the this uh, our left one tends to go actually more into the tail uh, than our one on the the right uh, tends to uh, let up and not go all the way down the tail. So there is some some tail differences in color as well, uh, but mostly um, they they have their their bright color here on the chest and belly area. So we've got a great color in terms of where you're going to find it. This is again is, is probably another backyard bird. You might find it on a um, a bird feeder one is definitely more common than the other one, depending on where you are. And uh, what's going to be really helpful, you know, this bird in particular, for me in Massachusetts, one of these birds is a lot less common than the other. And this is why range is important. It's coming a little bit more up into to Massachusetts, but it would definitely be not as common. So if you're having a little bit of difficulty remembering which one is, is which, uh, and you're in a region like mine, or a little bit further north, say like New Hampshire, uh, finding one of these would definitely not be as, as common. And you would want to really check and make sure if you're gonna ID the one um, on the right, then you would definitely want to make sure that you have all of the 
the traits and characteristics. Uh, um, make sure you want to have them down before you uh, choose that bird because uh, it's definitely not that common. So range definitely plays into this bird and identifying it. That is uh, an important thing and not just this coloration. Uh, so we have range and it's going to, the behavior, the habitat, I mean, just like the, the finches, it's, it's uh, going to be in more of those uh, low-lying um, shrubs, bushes. It'll hang some on the low lower trees. Uh, it will uh, fly around to different areas um, trying to locate uh, food. It likes the smaller trees that produce uh, fruit. Uh, so it will go to fruit trees. And so you'll, you'll find this a lot of times at more of your eye level areas. And, um, and it will be up a little bit higher up as well, definitely more than the finch, um, a little bit higher up uh, in the tree, especially if it's nesting in certain areas. And uh, I think those are probably our, our, our biggest uh, characteristics that we're gonna find in, in these birds. So on the left, we have a Baltimore Oriole. They're both Orioles. We have a Baltimore Oriole, and on the right, we have an Orchard Oriole. And um, yeah, they're both beautiful birds. They're very loud birds. We don't talk about that much about song uh, in this uh, introductory course. I think song, uh, the, the song that it puts out is one of the, the more harder uh, traits to, to pick up when you're introduced to birds. But the Baltimore Oriole has a very strong, uh, powerful song as well that really sticks it out to a lot of people. We've had the opportunity to learn about how we can ID birds, and I really want to try and put this into practice. So I'm going to go outside and, um, one, teach you a couple more things, and then see if we can locate a bird and then try to go through the process of identification. Uh, if you are at home, I definitely encourage you can, um, you know, go out outside and try to bird yourself on a walk. You can bird right outside your window, uh, or if you do have a backyard or a side yard, uh, you can always uh, go out and use the space right around your home. We did talk a lot about how abundant birds are, and there are a lot of birds that like to take advantage of, uh, spaces in neighborhoods, around even apartment buildings, any trees, wherever there's a food source. So birds are everywhere. So wherever you have that's accessible, definitely encourage you to try to get out at least for uh, a portion of this day or use some of your new skills in terms of trying to identify. So I'm going to go outside and you can follow along. Uh, again, I'm going to teach you some things uh, and we will see if we can find a bird and try to identify it. So we're outside now getting ready to try and find some birds and this is actually a very good time to do some birding uh, you know there's not as many leaves on the trees which reduces anything getting in the way of of uh, the birds and what you're looking for and we're also getting really close to the migratory season when a lot of birds are going to be coming back uh, but also a lot of birds are going to be passing through and some rare birds that you might not see very often because they don't live in your area uh, might be coming through because of migration. So there's, uh, it's kind of an exciting time going back to, you know, what's really fun about birding. And, and one of those uh, definitely for me is finding things that you've never seen before. Uh, now's a really good time for that. So I think it's very important that a couple things are identified before you start to really get into looking for birds. And one of the first things is that, um, you know, when I often go birding with people for the first time, they get into a habit of looking up all the time, thinking that birds really only exist high up in the trees, are always flying around, uh, but birds actually have really a diverse array of uh, ecosystems that they live in. And so uh, you could have birds that uh, live on the ground, uh, nest on the ground, and do a lot of feeding uh, in those locations. Uh, I actually just saw a tufted titmouse uh, trying to find some food on the path I'm on. Uh, so there's they're on the ground. Uh, a lot like to... Uh, live in shrubbery, really thick shrubbery, like um, you've got a bunch of sparrows that really like those areas uh, because they have uh, you know extra protection and they also have uh, more food in those areas. Uh, so shrubbery, and those tend to be at, at eye level, thick shrubs. Um, and then, yeah, you do have 
the 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 birds that really like the higher up in the trees tend to be perched on the the branches things like hawks and owls um, and then you have them that are of course flying uh, overhead and you have the lakes i have right over here you have the you know the lake environments for the the, the birds that tend to uh, spend most of their time uh, out on the the water the ducks geese uh, herons um, and you obviously have a diverse array of different waterways so you have the salt waters get uh, different birds in those areas as well so you know don't get stuck only going to one environment or looking in one environment to find the birds uh, really spend your time uh, you know looking spanning across uh, all different environments to see what you can find and in addition if you're out birding and you're really really struggling to find anything I highly suggest that you change your environment that you look for something else and so if you're in the woods and you're having a really hard time finding anything you know get out of the woods and go to a different location like uh, maybe some tall grasses uh, or even a lawn a lawn is another great place to look um, you know you tend to have some of the the birds that are looking on freshly cut lawns for uh, things that have popped up uh, to eat so you know change your environment Another good thing to do is really uh, learn about how to use your binoculars in the right way. I know uh, we talked about you know, how to put things into focus and how to use your binoculars uh, themselves, but one of the important things to remember or that takes some practice is getting a bird in the frame of your um, in the frame of your binocular so when you pull up your binoculars you can uh, see the bird and then do all those things that we already practiced so what's really really a, a, a useful tip is that when you do locate a bird uh, tend to look with your eyes at that bird and then stare at it and when you're looking at that bird, bring the binoculars straight up to your eyes. And you have a much better chance of having that bird end up being in the frame of your binoculars. You know, that is instead of you possibly see a bird bringing up your binoculars and trying to look around to see if you can find it. You have such a small area in your binoculars of view that doing that really reduces your chance of uh, getting that bird into frame so look at it with your eyes you can even practice inside look at something with your eyes that's far away and then bring your binoculars up and see how close you are to frame in your binoculars with what you can find so uh, those are two really helpful tips when you're getting out to bird and something that uh, definitely you should keep in mind I've been walking around for a little while now looking for birds and uh, they've been a little scarce today but I have come across uh, a bird and here's what we are going to do uh, I'm going to describe it to you and pull out a lot of those things that we talked about uh, earlier in the uh, course and after I describe it and talk about it and where it is and what it's doing, I'm gonna put a, a photo up so you can also get a good visual. But I want to be able to walk you through really what takes place when you're out um, and the things that I go through uh, mentally as I'm going through this process. Um, and then we'll put up the photo and then I really want you to pause the video and see if you can take a moment to identify the bird and then we'll come back uh, and I'll talk about what it is and uh, really how we got to that conclusion. So right now the bird that I'm looking at is on one of the trees and it's actually on the side of the tree and it's actually upside down meaning that the the bird is walking down the tree which for this bird is actually a, one of its more defining characteristics and something that uh, sticks out to uh, people when they do locate this bird and uh, it's not a very large bird it is probably about the size I would say of, uh, of a phone a more common phone uh, now like a larger iPhone uh, 
So it's about the size of a, a pretty common phone now. And it's very kind of um, long. The head of it tends to go out like this. It's very long, um, kind of pointy head. And on the top of it, on the crown of its head, is it's just, it's black. Uh, it's all black. Um, just on the crown though, on the sides of its face is more white um, and just this nice um, crown on the back. And then its, it's uh, back colors are more uh, bluish and underneath it's just really a solid white color. Um, so it's climbing down more of a, a pointy beak, a long pointier beak. Um, or to something to actually like get inside of uh, of something maybe in like the crack of the tree so it's definitely got a longer beak and uh, that diverse array of colors but what's really important on this bird just a little tip because I do know what bird it is uh, there are a couple types of this bird and one of the important characteristics is that its belly is all white so uh, that's how you can tell this bird uh, from the other bird that has a different color belly. So um, I'm going to put up a photo, go ahead and pause the video and see if you can take all these characteristics, the video, um, the picture of the bird, and see if you can identify uh, the bird that we have here in front of me uh, hanging out on the street. We oh, are back inside now and it was great to get outside for a moment and see what birds we could find and we did find the one bird and we put up a photo of it uh, and I hope we got a chance to try and ID it uh, using some of the behaviors that I talked about, some of the unique traits and got a chance to use your ID guide. The bird that was located was a white-breasted nuthatch and you did probably see in your ID guide in the paragraph and it did talk about how you know one of its unique things is that it does climb down trees head first is one of its its uh, defining behaviors and then when I pinpointed the, the the white underside was a way to tell from the other nut hatches um, that it's not just a nut hatch but the white breasted nut hatch really focusing in on the the underside color all the other colors are, are pretty similar to all the other nut, other nut hatches but that really defined that one so it's great to get out and do that i really encourage you to get out and do more of this to use the new skills that you've developed to get out and try and id birds uh, go through that process and really you know when you're out um, you know give it your best shot enjoy yourself it, you can't id every single bird uh, it's it's really really difficult sometimes with unique traits and colorations and just have some fun don't get frustrated if you can't id it yet the more you get into it the more you id birds the more that you are going to be able to to pick out um easier what, what birds that you are finding and you really will begin to enjoy yourself i encourage start a checklist uh, go through birds see how many you can find in a year and uh, i think you'll have a lot of fun with it it was great to talk with you all today i hope you enjoyed this and uh, welcome more to the birding community and and have some fun out there.